Christ's, spake Zarathustra, as the highest and deepest book in existence, a statement which stretches critical altimeters and credulity alike. As if this isn't enough, there follow chapters headed, Why I am so wise, Why I write such great books, and Why I am destiny, in which he advises against alcohol, endorses oilless cocoa, and commends his bowel habits. The bombast and self-absorption of Zarathustra were reappearing with a vengeance in mania. In January 1889 the end came. While walking down a street in Turin he collapsed, flinging his arms tearfully around the neck of a horse which had just been whipped by its driver. Nietzsche was assisted to his room, where he wrote postcards to Cosima Wagner. I love you, Ariadne, the King of Italy, my beloved Umberto, I am having all anti-Semites shot, and to Jacob Burkhardt, signing himself Dionysius. Burkhardt understood what had happened, and passed the card on to a friend of Nietzsche's, who went at once to collect him. Nietzsche was now clinically insane, and never recovered. Almost certainly his condition would have been incurable even today. It was brought on by overwork, solitude, and suffering. But the prime cause was syphilis. This had reached the tertiary stage, which apparently involves mental paralysis. After a brief spell in an asylum, Nietzsche was released into the care of his mother. He was now harmless, existing for much of the time in a catatonic trance which reduced him to an almost vegetal state. During his more lucid moments he appeared to have a vague memory of his past life. When he was handed a book, he remarked, "'Didn't I write good books, too?' After Nietzsche's mother died in 1897, he was looked after by his sister, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche. This was the last person who should have been put in charge of him. Nietzsche's younger sister, Elizabeth, had married Bernard Forster, a failed schoolmaster who became a notorious anti-Semite. Nietzsche despised him, both as a man and for his ideas. Forster had set up an Aryan race colony called Nueva Germania in Paraguay, using poor yeoman farmers from Saxony. He ended up defrauding them, and then committed suicide. The remnants of Nueva Germania still exist in Paraguay, where the master race now live much the same as the local Indians, virtually indistinguishable except for their blonde hair. When Elizabeth returned to Germany and took charge of her insane brother, she was determined to turn him into a great figure. She moved him to Weimar because of its elevated cultural associations with Goethe and Schiller, with the aim of establishing a Nietzsche archive. Then she began doctoring her brother's unpublished notebooks, inserting anti-Semitic ideas and flattering remarks about herself. These notebooks were published as The Will to Power, which has since been purged of this rubbish by the great Nietzsche scholar Walter Kaufmann to produce what is arguably Nietzsche's greatest work. This book is continued on Disc 2. Afterward Nietzsche died two deaths. His mind died in 1889, his body in 1900. Between these dates his work took on a life of its own, launching Nietzsche from almost total obscurity to worldwide intellectual eminence. Nietzsche would of course have considered this no more than his due. But this fame was to exceed even his own megalomaniacal fantasies. It extended far beyond the field of philosophy, largely owing to Nietzsche's appeal to writers. The list of major twentieth-century figures Nietzsche influenced includes Yeats, Strindberg, O'Neill, Shaw, Rilke, Mann, Conrad, Freud, and countless lesser figures who were simply overwhelmed by his ideas. This was a philosophy with a difference, one with style and lucidity. Here was a philosophy you could actually read, and the fact that it was written in aphorisms meant you also had time to read it, or bits of it. And this was the trouble. Now lots of people read just bits of Nietzsche. 
Such ideas as the will to power and the superman became commonplace and widely misused. Nietzsche's superman was soon hijacked by the racist lobby. Anti-Semites, then fascists, began lifting remarks from Nietzsche's work regardless of context. The very looseness of Nietzsche's philosophy now became its undoing. As a result of its grotesque misuse during the first half of the twentieth century, Nietzsche's philosophy was badly discredited. Consequently, it is almost impossible to talk about many of Nietzsche's ideas in the way he intended, especially his ideas about the superman, discipline, breeding, and the like. The poetic looseness of much of his writing left it too open to hideous travesty. Fortunately, it also left his remarks on such dangerous topics open to ridicule, which is perhaps the most appropriate contemporary response. Yet it is worth remembering that Nietzsche made his views on racism, anti-Semitism, and related attitudes perfectly plain. As he clearly states, the homogenizing of European man is the greatest process that cannot be obstructed. One should even hasten it. When the Nazis attempted to take him on board as their official philosopher, and Hitler kissed Elisabeth Forster Nietzsche's hand outside the Nietzsche archive in Weimar, it was the Nazis who entered the realms of higher lunacy not Nietzsche's philosophy. Nietzsche's Key Philosophical Concepts Nietzsche's philosophy was written mainly in aphorisms and is not methodical. His attitude remains largely consistent, but his thought is constantly developing in different directions. This means that he frequently appears to contradict himself, or leaves himself open to conflicting interpretations. His was a philosophy of penetrating insights, not a system. Yet certain words and concepts recur again and again in his work. In these the elements of a system are detectable. The Will to Power This is the major concept in Nietzsche's philosophy. He developed it from two main sources, Schopenhauer and the ancient Greeks. Schopenhauer had adopted the Oriental idea that the universe was driven by a vast blind will. Nietzsche recognized the force of this idea and adapted it to human terms. In the course of Nietzsche's studies of the ancient Greeks, he concluded that the driving force of their civilization had been the search for power rather than anything useful or immediately beneficial. Nietzsche concluded that humanity was driven by a will to power. The basic impulse for all our acts could be traced back to this one source. Often it became transformed from its primary expression, or even perverted, but it was always there. Christianity appeared to preach the very opposite, with its ideas of humility, brotherly love, and compassion, but in fact this was no more than a subtle perversion of the will to power. Christianity was a religion— born out of slavery in the Roman era, and it had never lost its slave mentality. This was the will to power of slaves, rather than the more recognizable will to power of the powerful. Nietzsche's will to power proved a very useful tool when he came to analyzing human motive. Acts, which had previously appeared noble or honorably disinterested, were now often revealed as decadent or sick. But Nietzsche failed to answer two main objections— if the will to power was the only yardstick, how could actions that appeared not to follow its immediate dictates be other than degenerate or perverted? Take, for instance, the life of a saint or an ascetic philosopher such as Spinoza, whom Nietzsche admired. To say that the saint or ascetic philosopher was exercising his will to power on himself was surely to render the concept so flexible as to be almost meaningless. Second, Nietzsche's notion of the will to power was circular. If our attempt to understand the universe was inspired by the will to power, surely the concept of the will to power was inspired by Nietzsche's attempt to understand the universe. But the last word on this penetrating but dangerous concept should remain Nietzsche's. The manner of this lust for power has changed through the centuries, but its source is still the same volcano. What we once did for the sake of God, we now do for the sake of money. 
this is what at present gives the highest feeling of power. De Morgenrute, The Dawn, 204 Eternal Recurrence According to Nietzsche, we should act as if the life we are living will go on recurring forever. Each moment we have lived through, we will have to relive again and again for eternity. This is essentially a metaphysical, moral, f-